Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dennis Weiser. I'm currently president of the Board of Education of the Racine Unified School District. I'd like to welcome you here tonight. It's never an easy task coming out on a winter night when it's getting dark, so thank you for being here. We hope this is of value to you this evening. Before we go any further, I'd like to introduce a, introduce a couple of my fellow board members who are here tonight. In the front row, we have Pastor Melvin Hargrove. Thanks again for coming tonight. Our superintendent, Dr. Lolly Hawes, joined the Racine Unified School District July 1st and has been a, at hard at work ever since on a three-year strategic plan for our school district. She spent a great deal of time over the summer and early fall meeting with diverse groups from every corner of the district. She's been working very hard with the staff in the district. She's been working hard with the school board, getting up to speed and preparing to engage the important work and challenging issues that are before us at this time in raising the achievement and performance of our students across the district. This evening, Dr. Hawes will share her three-year plan with you and offer you as members of the community an opportunity to ask questions about these plans and the future of our school district. The plan she will share with you demonstrates a great deal of research, relationship building, discussion, collaboration, careful thought, and reflection. The school board is watching eagerly as the work presented in this plan starts to unroll to address, it, to address the challenges that lie before us. Again, thank you for being here tonight. Thanks to Gilmore staff, to Gilmore students for helping us with the facilities tonight. And please help me welcome Dr. Lolly Hawks. Thanks, Mr. Weiser. I also have to thank Gilmore. Did you all get serenaded walking oh, in the yeah. door? Wasn't that wonderful? They're, they were telling me they're going in two months to a competition in Florida for middle school vocal performance. So I wish them luck. They sounded great. And our hosts and hostesses coming in, that was very nice. You'll be meeting all the different chiefs here in just a minute as we get to their part in the, in the uh, presentation. So uh, I'm going to move through things. Please take some notes, follow along, and then we'll Make sure to leave some time at the end if you have questions or comments because this is a plan and we're moving forward on it, but we also need to hear things that we need to think about, things from your perspective that we should be sure to incorporate, that sort of thing. So this is um, the plan. When I, when I started looking at coming to Racine, uh, many superintendents and larger and, uh, school systems put together an entry plan that helps the school board and the community know what's the plan, how, how will a new superintendent come aboard. And so I put that together for thinking about coming to Racine and wanted to be sure that I was meeting the needs of the board because the board spent a lot of time thinking about what kind of superintendent they wanted to hire and what they wanted that person to do. So from May to July, even though I didn't start until July, I was doing a lot of work for Racine in May and June. And uh, I really uh, worked on learning the priorities that the board had and understand the policies and where the district was, was as far as the board was concerned and what they wanted in their new superintendent. Then July through October, as many of you know, I was in many places meeting many people, many different groups and constituencies. Then in November, uh, I put together a summary of everything that I'd heard and seen and learned from all of you and all of the people here. And then in December, and this is tonight is really the same as that December event, is responding then to all of the things that we've heard, learned, and seen in terms of what are we going to do about it. And that's the plan. That's the raising we're seeing, accelerating, and leveraging our work. In January and beyond, we are already, all of the chiefs and I, and many people in many places across the district, already working feverishly on now making that plan go because we believe if we accomplish the things that we've put in this plan, you will be the proud residents, employees, and uh, community members of a great school system on its way to being top notch. So that's where we are. Uh, many people, as I said, and many things went into this plan and contributed to the thinking. And these are just a few of the groups and sets of, of uh, information and learning that 
uh, supported me in understanding what Racine's issues are, what their strengths are, what the points of pride are, and from all these different perspectives, what do we need to do about it? So all of those groups, thank you very much for providing that. These are the 20,301 human beings, little people, children who are in our care that get up every morning just like me and come to school. And as I've said several times, I do have that number right on my nightstand on the side, right where I see it when I wait, open my eyes in the morning. Because as I'm getting up, I'm trying to remember that 20,300 children are also getting up out of bed and getting ready to come to school. And all of the teachers and all of the assistants and the custodians and the bus drivers who are already up probably at that time, all of us coming together on behalf of all these different children, every single one of them different, unique, special, every one of them deserving our very best, every one of them being we are the ones that form their future and their growth and their ability to graduate college and career ready and go on with their lives and doing whatever they want to do. So we've called this plan Raising Racine. And by that we mean raising our children, raising our community, raising our schools, raising our expectations, raising literally everything. It's so interconnected that everything that we do in our schools raises the bar for other pieces and parts of our community. Employment rate, home values, uh, all of those things that, that go into a great school system in a community. So we are about the work of raising Racine, the children and the community. So these are just a quick summary of the key points from what I've learned and what I know that form the basis of how we do want to do our plan and what our priorities need to be. We know that student achievement and closing gaps in achievement between groups like our students of color, our students who are have disabilities, our students who don't speak English, they're not achieving at the level of other groups of students. We need to do that. I know for sure that this community wants all of our schools to improve and expects us to do that. Uh, our schools need to be positive places to learn and positive places to work. And in many cases, they are. But if there's, I hear some doubt about that sometimes, or we need to be able to assure with confidence that that's the case. Uh, we have diversity in this community that is our strength. It is the strength. It is the best thing about us. And we need to capitalize on that and help all of us realize and recognize what that strength, what that rich opportunity brings to our community. We also have poverty in this community, and that will never be an excuse. That is never the reason, but it certainly impacts how we have to approach the work that we do with our families and our children. We have students, I see them everywhere I go. I think you saw them walking in tonight. We have such talented, high potential kids, so much that they can do. And we are the, the people that can unlock that key. And that's a huge responsibility. Uh, we have teachers and leaders in our schools who are respected by the community. And those people need more support from their school system. They need more resources to do the work they need to do. And they need better learning, professional development, and growth to be able to meet the needs of the kids sitting in front of them every day. We are also very fortunate, I think, in Racine to have a school board that's committed to that same thing. Sometimes districts, school districts of this size will have a school board that's got all kinds of people with particular single interest issues that they're, that they're campaigning on and running on and, and won't let the district move because they keep bringing up some topic. You are fortunate in this community to have a school board who is very much aligned around, let's get this school district to serve the kids in the best way possible and get the best results for our kids. And then finally, we are better than our perception. And we don't communicate that well. Our perception is not good. And it's not as good as we really are. So we do want to make sure that we communicate to all of you and to the community that we are good at what we do, we are a good school system, becoming a great one, and we need to do a better job of communicating those things about us that are good. So when I came to Racine, this, this is, uh, well, I bet you all know what that says. <laughs> 
That's what I felt, saw, and uh, learned about Racine when I came. Many people, many groups, many organizations, many initiatives within the school system, many, 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 many things going on. Hard work, the right work, but not aligned. It was all in different directions. In many cases, some of those arrows were the very same work and different groups doing it and didn't even know that there were other groups doing it. That's a problem because we can't accomplish anything. And we often run into a roadblock or we run out of steam or we don't have the support or you don't get the resources. So uh, this is intended to show you organizationally what I think was, is occurring, was occurring in Racine that we need to get our arms around in the school system in order to accomplish our important goals. So what we want to think about is picking some work, narrowing it down to a few arrows, and all of those arrows going in the same direction to address the priorities that we have. What are the priorities? Well, I'm sorry, I'm stepping ahead here. These arrows then, if we line one behind the other behind the other, gain the kind of momentum and support and alignment that does get our district to the priorities that we need to address. So we are here uh, sharing with you that we intend to do a few things really well and stay with them for several years. So as I've said several times, this is the plan. We are very intentional about going to be saying if somebody comes with a great new idea or a great new plan or a great new thing we could also do, that this is not the time because we've set what we're going to do and we can't continue to add more and new things. There are many more things we need to do. We're trying to stay with a few right now and get those right and then we can go to the next phase of what else do we need to do. So the three priorities that will consume all of our work this next three years are around raising student achievement, particularly in reading and math. Reading and math is the source of everything else and is the basis for all learning going forward academically. Secondly, we must close those achievement gaps for students of color and students in special education. Students of color and students in special education significantly underperform compared to their peers in our school district and across the nation. So this is work that many school systems are doing and we will be doing as well. And then thirdly, is making sure that our schools have very positive learning environment where school is a good place to go. I have relationships with people there. I trust the people there. I believe the people there are on my side. There's someone there to help me. That it's a place where if I make a mistake, someone helps me figure out how to correct it versus thinking about how much can they punish me for it. So we want to shift the, the, the school's perception and, and, and in fact, the positive, welcoming place that it is for children and for adults to work in and for people to come and visit so that it's a positive, warm place. So to accomplish those three goals, and they're not small goals, and they're not easy ones necessarily, we've aligned the work uh, in the district uh, around chiefs. So we've reorganized the, the way that we have our leadership in central office. So we have a chief academic officer over all of instruction and curriculum, a chief of schools who is over all of the principals, over the, um, the uh, school climate, the suspensions and the way we manage behavior, and over um, the school improvement plans the chief operations officers over all of the facilities, the budget, the transportation, those things that make our schools and our system click and move along. Chief communication and community engagement is just that, making sure that we're communicating well with people inside and outside of our organization and that we are bringing uh, your voices uh, into the room as we make our plans. And then finally, chief of human capital, responsible for 
recruiting and hiring the very best people, and then once they get here, helping them grow and develop and retaining them because this is the best place that they can find to work anywhere. And those people and the work underneath each of them that they're doing will move us to accomplishing those three priorities. So we are committed to three priorities in the next three years. This is a, a graphic that's intended to convey to you how we look at our work. Many times when you draw organizational charts, you end up with the board at the top, and then the superintendent, and then those chiefs, and then those people, and then these people, and then down at the bottom of the page, what's down there? <laughs> Students, maybe teachers, down at the bottom. So this is a different way to portray that, and I, maybe somebody can help me with what, do you, what, what strikes you, uh, what is the point of this? Students are at the center of everything. <laughs> so it's our students who are our focus, they're the target, and the North Star is, are the different measures that we use in, in our organization to, to accomplish success on their behalf. And then around them are the cl people closest to the students who need the support of, the peop of their principals and assistant principals, who are supported by many people uh, in different offices, that they're the people to call when they need help. And beyond then are those five chiefs, those five different colors, and each of them has a particular set of responsibilities. And they're supported uh, by myself as superintendent. And the people and work that supports me is the Board of Education and our mission, which is educating every child to succeed. And then that outer ring represent all the various constituencies of our community that are that are uh, embracing and supporting us in this work. So the idea is that all of us have our arms around someone who has their arms around others who, and around others so that our students are the focus and the essential piece of everything we do every day. So when I did my uh, presentation to the community on the uh, the things that I learned and heard and saw, we put it in, we organized it around leadership, student success, communication, and efficiencies. Tonight, I'm focusing uh, with all of you on this work of leadership. The students, success, and teaching and learning are, are the chief academic officer and the chief of schools. Communication is the chief for that. And then the efficiencies are uh, chief operations officer. So the chiefs represent almost all of the rest of that work. The work of the plan for the superintendent is around making sure that our organization and the people in it have the capacity to do the work they need to do, that, we, that I am responsible for raising the quality and effectiveness of the leadership at the highest levels, and making sure that they are providing direct support to teachers and students at the center of that, of that circle, set of circles. So we're gonna go through these different chiefs briefly to share the kind of work that they're going to be doing over the next three years. So first of all, Chief Academic Officer, and that is Rosalie Daca. Rosalie. <laughs> uh, Rosalie's work is around monitoring and providing for student learning. Accountability is really assessing and collecting data and measuring and holding people accountable to results in student learning and achievement, teacher learning, which is professional development, making sure our curriculum is right, that instruction, that the way we teach is right. She's also over special education. ELL is English language learner programs, career and technical education programs, gifted and talented program, and early childhood. That's a long list. That's the core of what we do. So some of the things that Rosalie and her team will be doing will be to make sure that our students experience a rigorous curriculum and have engaging instruction leading to college and career readiness and higher graduation rates. Much of the work will be around the Common Core State Standards, which are um, indicators for every grade in reading and math that say what children need to know by the end of each grade. What do they need to know at the end of third grade in reading, the end of third grade in math? 
Once teachers have that, they need to plan from that then what they will teach and when they will teach it. And Rosalie's work and the people that work with her are to help teachers see what they should be teaching when, recommending resources and materials, and also making sure that we have assessments along the way to measure how the kids are doing so that teachers know if the kids are learning what they're teaching or if they need to take more time or if they can move along. She's also uh, going to set up a way for our school system to every three years look at each of our programs. So you'll see in the fall one-third of all of our curriculum and one-third of our programs. So it would be things like reading and physical education and instrumental music and gifted programs and special education maybe are the ones for next year. And then there will be teams of teachers and parents and community leaders and experts from our post-secondary institutions all studying what's the best research in those, in those different programs and curriculum, what are we doing in Racine, what results are we getting, and making recommendations to myself and to the board for implementation in years two and three. And then, then the fourth year we come back and we do it again. So every year we're looking at one third of those programs to make sure that we're always and continuously improving them. She's also doing a huge piece with reforming our high schools so that we have academies and freshman cohort groups that make, uh, help our students be in smaller groups of, of peers so that those high schools don't feel so huge and, and um, the teachers feel so distant that they have a core group of teachers that know them, counselors and support folks. She's also uh, responsible for making sure that we have the most excellent professional learning, professional development program calendar for our teachers that, that anyone has anywhere. I believe very strongly that that's critical for our success, that our teachers have support, opportunities to select training, opportunities to learn and grow, and opportunities to be as effective as they can be. We also looking at realigning people in central office to put them out into the schools more. So we will be working to eventually get to a coach in every single year at the end of three years and we will be probably not right off the bat next year but maybe coach for every several schools and then the next year add more and add more so that there's a person in every school who's not evaluative but is highly skilled and can sit with teachers in groups or one-on-one -on -one and help them practice and develop their skills. The main part of her instructional work and accountability work will be to focus on our reading and math achievement and we need to recast our special education programming. We have, we have enormous resources in terms of people working in special education but we're not having any results from it. So we're rethinking how we can use those people to do that work to results. English language learners, that's a group of students in our district who are doing better than any, most any school system in Wisconsin and in the area and actually we have a lot of points of pride around our English language learner programs and we know we can do more especially in our middle and high schools for students learning English. And finally she'll be looking at some particular programs including our gifted program. We want to get to a place where whatever school you go to, we know, I believe, that there are gifted children in every single school and the notion that we just have one school in elementary for them to go to is um, not the right notion. So we need to find a way to serve a, any children who are gifted and talented in any school. And so that will be a big piece of work coming down the road in, within the next three years. We also want to look at Spanish immersion as to see if that's a viable option for a school program to offer. And finally, we will be moving to full day four-year-old kindergarten. So she's got her work cut out for her. <laughs> and that's only one-fifth of the work because the next person is chief of schools and that's Dr. Gallion, Eric Gallion. Dr. Gallion was the first person that I was able to hire when I started and I'm so glad we did. 
he's, he's uh, done a wonderful job so far. Dr. Gallion is over principals. He's also responsible for the work of the social workers and counselors. He is also uh, charged with uh, the school improvement plans that principals are implementing to raise the quality of our schools and the outcomes. He's also responsible for the school climate, which has to do with suspensions, alternative programs, expulsions, all of that, student behavior. He also is responsible for growing our principals, just like teachers need professional development to develop their skills. He is responsible for making our principals develop leadership skills and instructional knowledge to help them lead quality schools. He's also got after school and the alternative programs. So some of the things that he'll be doing in the next three years include um, making sure that our principals are making sure that students are successful every day, every hour, every minute. And I know Dr. Gallion means that when he says that. Every day, every hour, every minute. So he's working on the school improvement, improvement plans to make sure that um, the goals that principals are setting are consistent. So in middle school, if we're focusing on attendance or suspensions or math achievement, that all of the middle school principals have those in their plans or that all of our schools are working on reading achievement. So every school would have a reading goal, that sort of thing. He's also, uh, as you probably are reading in the paper, we've already done, and he's done that great work of uh, revamping our alternative programs and the MAC Center and what the MAC Center student population looks like. And we've created uh, an opportunity for students with severe behavior issues to go to a therapeutic learning environment that's called Turning Point. So MAC Center is really for kids who don't have enough credits and need to accumulate them quickly or who need a different environment than a large comprehensive high school. Students with significant behavior issues will be lots of wraparound, we call it wraparound, where they have social workers, therapists, counselors, and the right kind of teachers who can, who can um, help students who struggle with behavior or mental illness. And then uh, leadership development is, of course, uh, the professional development. Our leaders have all learned how to be coaches and how to coach people rather than direct people in a way that, that's um, punitive. Uh, they also are learning educator effectiveness, which is the Wisconsin state law for how we evaluate teachers now. It's a much more rigorous process for teacher evaluation. And uh, he's responsible for making sure our principals are trained and competent at doing that, as well as making sure that we're helping our teachers. And he's doing that in collaboration with Ms. Daka for um, making sure that our teachers understand and know this new evaluation system. Finally, the school climate and culture. We are setting in place a program called Positive Behavior Intervention and Supports. We have that in, I, I believe, 10 of our schools now. We want to have them in all of our schools. This year, at, there's different levels of implementation at at least the basic level in all of our schools, which is to say we set up a positive climate. And uh, we have a huge grant that we receive from the federal government, many millions of dollars over the next few years to work on school climate and teachers and people in our schools um, and the way they interact with students. And we will be using those funds to make sure that we have programs that develop our students' social and emotional skills and our teachers' ability to uh, develop relationships with students in meaningful ways. Finally, we do and are already working on revising the student rights and responsibilities, our code of conduct, and all of the reasons why we suspend and don't suspend and what is a suspension and not a suspension and an expulsion, and that sort of thing, so that we're clearing that up and making it appropriate and just. So that's Dr. Gallion's work. Over the next three years, our chief operations officer has a lot of work to do as well, and that's Mr. Dave Hazen. Dave. Dave's list might look short, but it's a very big job. Budget, we have about $250 million a year in our budget. That's a lot of money to spend and spend wisely, and he oversees that. The financing of receiving that money and finding the sources and making sure the accounting is correct. 
Also our facilities, we have many, many buildings that have many, many needs and he's responsible for keeping those up and running and being safe, warm and appealing places, maintaining them. He's also responsible for all the technology infrastructure, the wiring, the wireless, all of those things in our schools. And then no small task is getting everybody to school at home every day on their buses. He's also responsible for enrolling students and making sure that we've got the right students at the right schools. And finally, making sure we pay people and that we pay our bills for things that we buy. Some of the work that he'll be doing over the next three years will be to ensure that all of those things are creating a positive environment for our people to work in and for our students to learn. So maintenance is a big topic. Our buildings are old. They need a lot of work. And we've had a model of when it breaks, we'll go fix it, hope it doesn't break. And we're shifting over, and it's take, it's, we're, in, we're in the middle of that, to a process like all of us should be doing, which is get your furnace checked every year, and then it won't break down. Or else you can wait and wait and wait, and someday it'll break down. So we're shifting over to the go out and do the maintenance in a routine way so that, so that those big, catastrophic, expensive breakdowns don't occur. We are also uh, putting together, and he will be developing a major maintenance plan for a five-year rolling plan. And what are the major pieces like parking lots and roofs and boilers, the big expensive items, and what do we do first and next and next and next? Our school budgets and our built district budget has, has been um, done in a way that's, well, if you got this much last year, you get this much this year, and you'll get that much next year. And there hasn't been a lot of um, holding people accountable to thinking about why you're spending money on that and what's the priority and how does that meet our goals. So you, you won't see so much, but our principals will see and all of our departments will see much more work from Mr. Hazen's office and sort of starting with that zero and saying how, what, what budget are you requesting and why and, and for what purpose and what did you spend it on last year and you spent, you didn't spend it all last year so why would we give you that much again? What are, what are you planning? What are you thinking? So much more aligned to the goals of each of the chiefs and each of the schools. Uh, so that's a, that would be a big process change internally that I believe will be much more efficient in how we spend our money and much more sure that we're spending our money on the right things. Uh, we have a structural deficit coming as well. And what that means is that every year as teacher salaries go up and the costs for uh, benefits go up, like insurance, with a, with a flat income, someday we're gonna hit a wall where, we, where the, the cost is more than the income. And so we need to uh, address that structural deficit that's coming in front of us and figure out what that means. Does that mean, does that mean we cut programs? Does that mean we look at class sizes? Does that mean we look at how many teachers we have? What does that mean? We need to figure that out. And I'm sure you in the community will be hearing about those, the thinking and the decisions and the plans for that. Uh, using our resources more effectively, uh, there are many processes in how we purchase things and how we buy in bulk, that sort of thing that will save us money. There will be savings around um, going out and, and using competitive processes to make sure we're getting the best price on things. And looking at our transportation, uh, pushing pretty hard on the transportation office to see where we can be a little bit more flexible in how we help parents get their kids to and from school every day in a way that still ensures that they're very safe and we always know where every child is all the time. And then finally, technology. That is a big ticket expense as well. Uh, we need to build that technology infrastructure. Our problem is now that our buildings have wireless, for example, but if a teacher in many of our classrooms wants to open up 30 laptops for everybody in the class to have one to do something, um, there are places in the schools where they can't do that. Uh, we just don't have enough, I'm not a technical expert, but we don't have the right wiring in place. So we need to go back through our schools and do that. We're, we have that underway, but that's another multi-million dollar price tag to do that at all of our schools. 
Well, we have to do it. We can't, the, few, the children of today can't even imagine a world where they wouldn't be doing that. They've never even lived anywhere in time where that's been true. Uh, we also want to make sure that our teachers have the right tools and ability to put technology into the curriculum. We don't want to teach technology, but we certainly want to use technology to teach and learn. And then all of the different databases and computer systems that are behind the scenes running things for us, we need to upgrade those. So that's the work of Mr. Hazen. Now we have uh, Stacy Tapp, Chief Communications and Community Engagement. Stacy is back here. There she is. Her job is to communicate, make sure we have relationships with all of our stakeholders and constituent groups, that all of you are engaged with us in, in thinking about the work and making sure that we're listening and you're hearing uh, from each other. She also is all of the media, the web page, the news media, the radio shows, all those things. She helps organize a lot of that. Uh, she's also, that will, a new part of her responsibility will be around a better way of engaging and partnering with all of the parents in the district. I think that's something we haven't done as well as we need to. Uh, and she also makes sure that she's communicating with all of our employees and the community on all of the different topics and matters that come up in the course of a school year. So her role is to make RUSD the district of choice in this competitive climate. We are, through Stacy, and we, I hope you saw that in the paper today, we're organizing and soliciting names for a superintendent advisory council, a group of people that will uh, advise the superintendent and help the superintendent uh, make decisions based on input from people inside and outside the organization around this year. This is this year's topics, our career and technical pro education programs, our full day kindergarten, our planning about our facilities use in the future, and how we can build better family partnerships. So if you are interested in any of those topics and have an area of expertise or want to be on the Superintendent Advisory Council, if you go to the website or if you check today's newspaper, you'll see how to put your name in the, in the um, applicant pool as we look at the right, getting the right mix of community representation. She's also organizing our parent key communicators. Right now we have a few schools that send parents to a, a larger body. She's worked to get all of our schools to have representation from parents, uh, again, to be ambassadors between the schools and ourselves. We're also looking at the family partnerships, and I've, as I've said, this is one position that if we do add a new position at central office, it would be this person to be the director of family engagement and partnerships to do things like organize uh, schools that would be interested in doing home visits. We know that if teachers do home visits, you have instant quality relationship with the parents and you can call anytime and they can call you and, and children do better. Uh, different ways to do our parent conferences uh, and also to establish a robust parent education program, something like a parent university where we have constant programs around, you know, what if my child's ADHD, I have a child who's having temper tantrums, how do I get applications for scholarships to college, um, all those kinds of things um, that we would have a parent uh, set of courses and classes and seminars and sessions that they could take and learn and grow as parents. And then her major last piece of work is raising our reputation through many different engagement activities. She's already done some of that this year and in terms of doing customer service training for everybody who picks up a phone in the district <laughs> and everybody who greets and meets people when they walk in the door. And we need to, she's helping all of our principals and ourselves tell our story better so that our perception of who we are is improved. <clears throat> and finally, we have Chief of Human Capital, which is Dan Thielen. There's Mr. Thielen. <clears throat> uh, Dan is committed to uh, recruiting, hiring, and retaining the best teachers and employees in all of our employment categories to ensure that those people are highly satisfied with their jobs, they stay a long time, that they get paid very competitively, 
that they have excellent benefits, and that they retire with, the, with pride and with the right retirement package that, that they've earned. And he's also responsible for making sure and uh, getting our buildings to have sufficient substitute teachers to cover the vacancies that we have. And his mission and the people that he works with are to make sure that Racine is the employer of choice in this world. So he's uh, looking at staff, how we staff our schools, how we set caseloads that are better uh, and very finely tuned to really maximize student achievement. He's expanding and doing very active recruiting so that people, we get the best people to come here and that we also have ways to make sure that people come here because it's the best place to work. We also are looking at this year a very basic and over time a process that teachers who want to transfer to a different position in a different school can do that electronically uh, without having, we have these things called arena staffing where large groups of people go and it's quite a process which can be done online. So we're work, he's moving toward that. Uh, he's also working very actively to recruit the right people and diverse people because we want our students to see people who look like them in all of our schools. Uh, we also, he's also done some great work in uh, establishing partnerships with a lot of our post-secondary institutions so that people who are teacher assistants have an uh, inexpensive and quick pathway to becoming a teacher if they wish, that teachers have career pathways to additional licenses and certifications or to leadership positions, that people who are in leadership positions have pathways to additional coursework and training to advance their skills. So we've done all many, many things are just beginning to unfold and, and teachers and employees will all be seeing that very soon. He's also working very hard on uh, making sure that our benefits and the things that we can offer our employees are appealing and attractive. Finally, uh, putting all of that management of personnel on a, online on a dashboard so it's uh, up to the minute uh, correct and making sure that everybody's job has the right job description and that we have all of the employment practices, the things that we ask employees to do and the way that employees are treated and the, the things that they're responsible for all point back right to student achievement. So that's his work. And that's all five of them. So you would all ask, so how are you gonna prove <laughs> that you're doing any of this, uh, and what will you measure your success by? So first of all, these will be some things that we are measuring our success, and you will see those. We're going to make those as public as possible. We just met last week to start to set our baseline. So say, here's where we started on each of these measures. And so year over year, you'll see how we're doing. The first one is PALS and MAP, which is PALS is readiness in kindergarten, first grade, second grade eventually for reading, and MAP are tests that children take in the fall and in the middle of the year and in the spring to see how much they're growing in a year. And that's for reading and math, K to eight. So you will see our students growing more than they have been across a year. You will see more of our students uh, showing on PALS, which is a test of uh, reading readiness, that they are ready to read at the next grade level by the end of the year. The growth measures, those same measures, we will look at if all of our students grow this much, our students in those achievement gap groups, so students of color, special education, if most students grow this much, those students need to grow more so that they catch up. And so you'll be, we will show you data to say, here's how everybody did and how much they grew, and here's how much these different groups grew. So we're closing that gap in performance. The third one, uh, there's a, I believe it's new this year. Is that right, Dr. Gallion? Dues? Is that new this year? It's a dropout early warning system that's available. It'll be available next year to sixth grade. Right now it's seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. And it reports to a school and a long list, all the students. We can tell in sixth grade we can predict if you're at risk for dropping out of high school. And the measures that predict that are your attendance so far 
your behavior, the number of behavior incidents you've had, and your grades and achievement. So this report comes from the state of Wisconsin. It's available to all schools and to our district. And most of our middle schools have lists of kids that are, they, they categorize kids at high risk, moderate risk, and low risk for dropping out. And so our middle schools have long lists of kids. And their ninth grade high schools have long lists of kids who are already labeled high risk to drop out of school. And so the work that we will be measuring our success by in middle school, as well as reading and math, is to say that the percent of kids on that list that are high goes down every year until we get to a very small band of kids being at risk. Because if you're already at risk of dropping out in sixth grade, you're nothing but trouble <laughs> for many years, and you drop out if we don't address the underlying issues of attendance, behavior, and academic learning achievement. And then finally, uh, a measure that we'll be looking at is students. Uh, we know that if students don't have 5.5 credits by the time they end ninth grade, the chance that they can graduate is slim to none. Because if they haven't earned those credits in ninth grade, they have to take the classes over in 10th grade. And so now they've lost their 10th grade year, catching up from ninth grade. And, and what happens is they spiral into a place that they can't get the credits they need to graduate on time. So our work is to make sure that all of our ninth graders end ninth grade, and we're still debating whether it's five credits or six credits, but with a certain number of credits, that means that they pass that many classes so that they can go to 10th grade and take 10th grade classes, and then 11th and 12th. So the measure of our success that we want to publicly share is how many of our students are ending ninth grade where they need to be in my high school. Uh, experts tell me that once they get through ninth grade and they come back in 10th grade, they've grown up enough to say, oh, I get it. <laughs> I have to do this. So ninth grade is sort of a year that we need to really support them. As Soon as they start to get off track, we have something in place to help them get back on track so they can pass that class and every class that they take. And eventually there'll be another one out there uh, because our ultimate goal is that every student will graduate with either a certain number of technical education credits or advanced placement credits that set them up to move into college with some credits in their pocket. And we're formulating that one, but eventually you'll see that is another measure. Like what percent of our kids leave? us uh, not just graduating, whew, I made it, but graduating with technical education credits or, or um, advanced placement credits for college. So that's what you can measure us by. And in three years, these are some of the things you can count on. That we will have a new North Star vision that's got some additional measures towards success and that will get us to those three priorities. We will have four year, full day, four-year-old kindergarten in our district. We are going to reduce class sizes in our core subjects at middle and high school and at our elementary schools by one student per year, which doesn't sound like a lot, but across the whole system, that's retaining a lot more teachers, and that goes from 29 to 28 to 27 to 26. So we're, every year, we're getting a little smaller in our class size. Uh, Standards-based grading, what that means is that uh, if the standard is that in third grade you have to know all your multiplication facts, then that's the standard. And if you know all your multiplication facts, you get an A. If you know 80% of them, you get a B. If you know 60% of them, you haven't met the goal or whatever you set. And that's how you get your grade. It's not, did I turn in my homework? Did I behave in class? Um, you know, was I, was I a dutiful student every day? The measure of your grade is, is aligned directly to what was the standard, what was the expectation for you to learn in that class. And if you can prove that you've learned it, you've passed. So that means that our subjects and our courses and our grades all need assessments to measure the same thing. Because what we see right now is that in some, let's take algebra, uh, some ninth grade, some high schools have 50% of their kids passing algebra. 
and out of 10 teachers, that teacher's got 80% of the students passing, this one's got 40% of the students passing. And what does that teacher teach and that teacher teach? Probably some very different things. So to say that at the end of the first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, and fourth quarter, every math, every algebra teacher has the same assessment, then if your kids pass or don't pass, we're all, we're all assessed in a, in a fair way. And we're assessed against standards and not did I turn my homework in on time. Now there's another part of your grade that can relate to your homework and your behavior and those things, but that shouldn't determine whether you've mastered the content and subject matter. So we'll be shifting over to that, to those standards-based report cards. Parents will actually see what their kids were supposed to have learned this quarter and then what their grade was on those things. You will see superior professional development. As much as I am passionate about student achievement, I am equally passionate about making sure our, our teachers and our teacher assistants have the best opportunities to learn and improve their skills whenever and however they want to or need to. And that we have coaching support for our teachers in all our schools. We will also see that we have a much more high quality, gifted and talented program that serves all students at all stu schools. And we will have planning underway to look at Spanish immersion. I don't know what the community and what people will say, but I believe we should look at Spanish immersion. And if that's a program that we should offer in this district, um, we need to think about that. Um, our middle schools, our middle schools are, we're a STEM school, we're a school for the arts, we're an IB school. But when you go to those schools, you don't really see that alive in the school. So in our middle schools, I believe the work has to be around when you walk into a middle school that says it's a STEM school, meaning science, technology, engineering, and math, you see it, you feel it, you know it, and it's very different from the other school that says it's an international baccalaureate school where students are self-engaged in their own learning and reflection and um, worldview. So that that school, is, they're both middle schools, but they're, you see what they are and you see who they are. Um, the next thing that you'll see is that our comprehensive high schools are aligned around what we're calling career academies. And this is a big shift, and it's going to take us three years to get there. But we want to have our freshmen come in and not have a class here and a class there and a class here and a class over there. They'll be in a cohort of about 150 kids. And those teach, there's, these are the teachers that teach those 150 kids. And here's another 150 and another 150. And so they have a group of teachers who are their teachers and counselor and a principal and social workers supporting just those kids. So it doesn't seem so big and broad and huge and, and that you, they don't get lost between the classes. <laughs> and, once, and part of what they'll be doing in that freshman year is a lot of career exploration, a lot of planning for their future. Every school at the high school level then will have three, probably three, academies. Uh, some examples might be a science and health, health sciences academy, uh, technology academy, and a fine arts academy. And so I'm a freshman and I pick one of those. So my classes now are focused around that and the careers in that area. I still have biology wherever I am. I still have chemistry. But they might have a slant to them. The health and sciences careers might have a biology that's slanted toward learning about biology as it applies to health careers. My sophomore year, I'll make some field trips, some visits to places in our community that have careers in those fields. My junior year, I might have an internship for a credit or two where I actually work in a hospital or ride with an ambulance company. Then my senior year, I'll have an apprenticeship where I'm actually side by side on a regular basis in some kind of career. And so I've now left high school with some experiences. What if I say I, I want to be an artist? I can still do that when I graduate. But what I've had is an opportunity to think about my career, to see what's out there, and to focus on something that interests me. And I've done it with the group of kids who are with me all those years along the way. So I develop relationships and friendships, and I have teachers 
all around me who I know very well because I have them year over year. So that's a plan that we're beginning to work on. Start with the freshmen, then we'll do the sophomores and the juniors and the seniors. So it's, it's, a, year, it's a year over year plan. Won't happen tomorrow. Uh, and then much better uh, programming around our at-risk kids, our kids who are struggling in school. What are we doing for them? You will see much more uh, clear understanding of what we do for those kids, what we use with those kids, what, op what choices there are, and um, what success they're having. And as I said before, budgets all align to what those priorities are around student achievement and safe and positive climates. And finally, many more opportunities for the community to be engaged. The first step was our uh, parent key communicators group and now, like I said, the superintendent advisory council having, asking you to be part of this work with us and give us your thoughts. And finally, school and district websites. Um, we're revamping those. You will see that transformation happen in the next few months. The websites will be much more interactive, much more informative, much more up to date. So we are about raising the bar and raising Racine. We are raising our community by the work we're about to do. We are raising our children. We're going to raise our employment rate as a result, our tax base, and our expectations for each other and ourselves. Because as we get better, the community gets better, and we all thrive. And we've all raised ourselves and uh, raised our children in a way that we can be proud of. So that's uh, the plan. And I think we have a little bit of time for questions, comments, or thoughts. So thank you. I know that's a lot to absorb. I've had months and months to think about it, and I sort of throw it out at you. So <laughs> it's a lot to absorb. But I do wonder if you have any questions, comments? Um, well, thank you for presenting. Um, I guess I'm just a little concerned about our goals to close the achievement gap and how that relates to what seems to me conflicting ideas with standardized testing in every year determining if students are doing well or not doing well. Uh, my experience that I had with standardized testing was that I felt like it wasn't assessing what I was learning at all mm -hmm. and was trying to put me in a track that I didn't belong in. Um, further, I'm concerned about the fact that um, some students are still being labeled as gifted and talented while others aren't. I really don't believe that philosophy and mm -hmm. I think that it's kind of pigeonholing these students that aren't gifted and talented when in reality it's probably something like we're coming in from different backgrounds but standardized testing is based on mm -hmm. a certain type of home life and a certain type of family background and what those students are learning at home so they are coming with an advantage mm -hmm. and then they're labeled as gifted and these other students aren't. So a couple of points. Thanks for that question. So standardized testing is one thing. And standardized testing is, when we say standardized testing, that is our state test, the WKCE that we have to give. And in the high schools now, it's called Explore and Plan for ninth and 10th grade. And those are, those are one kind of test. And that's a test that says, if you're in 10th grade, you have to get this score, and you either are you're over the line or you're not. So that's a standardized test that we're required to give. And that says, did you cross the line of proficient or are, do you know what you're supposed to know or not? So that's one kind of test and we give those once a year in selected grades because we have to. I don't think you saw anything up there for me referencing standardized tests. So we also give growth tests, which are math, and those are assessments of your growth, which we're also required to give. And those are to say, when you're with a teacher in a class for a year, and here's where you started, you have to grow statistically this much. If you start here, 
you grow this much, you start here, you grow this much, but everybody has to grow because that's exactly the argument that teachers and students would make. I started over here and I grew this much, but I didn't pass, so I'm a failure. I'm not really a failure, I grew this much. Somebody started here and grew to here and they passed, they're a success. That's not necessarily true because the growth was only this much, but for this child this much. So MAP measures our growth across a year and by looking at it at mid-year, that informs a teacher to say, she's not growing at the rate she needs to grow to, to make the kind of progress she needs to make in this one year. So that's another kind of test. And then the tests I was talking about up here are the tests to say, in first quarter, algebra one, these are the, these are the things you need to know. These are the things that teachers are supposed to teach. Do you know it or not? And it's not to say you passed or failed, it's to say you don't know this and this, I need to work with you on that to make sure you do know it because at the end of the year you have to know all of these things. And so the purpose of those assessments is to inform teachers work and we call those formative assessments. So there are a lot of assessments but we can't just teach and teach and teach and then at the end of the year say well let's hope they did well. That, that used to be the way we approached education. Now we say, we want to give you some information about how your students are progressing. I want to give you as a student information about how you are progressing and where you're strong and where you need to grow. I'll let you respond in a second because I want to talk about gifted. I think giftedness implies that you need, I need differentiation. I need something different in some subjects, maybe all subjects, but usually kids are gifted in language arts, reading, writing, or mathematics, or science. They may have a particular interest or a, partic a, a predisposition to that. And teachers are compelled to work with you differently because of that and set different expectations and help you continue to grow, not just assign you to help all the kids who don't get it in math or whatever. So gifted education, I am not um, advocating that we go out and work hard to identify all the gifted kids. I'm making sure that teachers recognize kids who need different work because the work that we've got isn't challenging. And that teachers are thoughtful about that and probably need a little support from people who can help them figure out what could I do with this child who already knows everything about American history because they've read every book about American history on the planet already and now they're in my class. What else could, what could I have this student do to be engaging? And so when I talk about gifted education and gifted children everywhere, that's what I'm saying, is that we have to rethink that saying, oh, you got a certain score and a test, you go to this special school and there's something special that's supposed to happen here. The idea is wherever you are, whoever you are, you've got to, a proclivity for some things and not so much for others and your teachers need to adjust their teaching for all the kids in their class in that way. So um, I hope that helps a little bit. I know that testing is a lot and it feels like a lot to students. Some of it's required and some of it's important for teachers so they have information about how their students are progressing. Yeah. No. Um, that's what happened a few years ago, almost happened a few years ago with mm -hmm. my younger daughter. Who it shouldn't. In the IB program and mm -hmm. doing very well. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was all based on the math testing, even mm -hmm. though she was doing very well in her mm -hmm. class. And so at that point in time, that would have stalled her progress. And I guess that's what we're both concerned about mm -hmm. that the um, emphasis on testing is not going to allow kids to be challenged to advance, to work hard, mm -hmm. they're basically going to shut down. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, this whole program that you're trying to implement, the tracking for the different groupings in high school, the mat testing to place kids where they belong. I, I haven't said anything like that. Up? We aren't placing anybody based on a MAP score. We don't. And we aren't, those career academies are a choice that children will select into. So there's no basis for any kind of um, selection other than students selecting themselves. Well, historically, that's what's happened when mm -hmm. we've seen. No. I've been through it. I have four kids in the school district. There's no one that has that intention. I'm, 
I promise you. Do you have anything to add? That's not, that's not the plan. The plan is to give the kids what they need and to set our schools up so that parents have choices right now. I think some parents don't feel like they have a choice and the kids don't feel like they have a choice. This is where I live. This is where I go to school. Whatever they have is what I get. And we're trying to set it up to more adequately meet the needs of the kids as well as the level that their instruction needs to be at. So we're not, tracking is not the plan. It's, it's like she said, to give the kids choices for the schools and the careers that they want to go into. And I know part of what you're saying in the past has, has happened, but we are in a new, uh, exciting part of the district where we want to do things better. We want to do things that are more aligned to what the kids need. So it's, that's the plan. It's not anything to track kids at all. I'll take you and then you, okay? Two things but kind of correlating. Um, when you were speaking about the grading system and about, home, about homework not being as much of a grade, to me homework shows responsibility right. and accountability for your future, for yep. going mm -hmm. to work when you're an adult. It's important skill. Some right. children don't test well, so that is a question for me. Then going on to the high school thing with these smaller sections so kids aren't going, you know, walking through a building five minutes. How does keeping them in a small group get them ready for going from junior high that's smaller to a bigger high school to then a huge college? Mm -hmm. How does keeping something small help them? So they these are for their core courses in the high school. They would be that they would be in this cohort of students. But if they're in band or if they're in physical education or you know their elective Spanish, the, you know other electives, that would that that's probably probably we haven't got the whole plan you know together. But that's probably open the way it's done now. Um, I don't know. Do you want to talk to the uh, grading and the homework? Yeah, um, both with the grading. Homework does play a role in the grading, in the standards-based grading process. It's just a lot of major emphasis placed on it. Because any kid can do homework, but not necessarily master the content. And so the emphasis with standard-based grading is that a student understands the content and is able to demonstrate that. Some kids do well with homework and, do, and know how to do that process very well and they know that they can do the homework and not necessarily demonstrate mastery and still get through the class with an A and B. This way, a kid that's real studious and real responsible will probably still get that A. A kid could be proficient in the classroom but not demonstrate that effort. And if that teacher is placing emphasis on them doing the homework and taking responsibility, then that kid could theoretically pass the class but pass at a lower level. My own child's in the standard space grade, and he has in one class he has an A in, and another class he has a C in, and the difference is he don't do the homework. So he's great on that. And the demonstrated mastery doesn't have to be a test. It can be a portfolio, it can be a project that a student has completed. So if you have to demonstrate mastery of these concepts, it may be that one isn't always going to be a test. And that's for sure too. And that's particularly important as we align to the Common Core State Standards, which are about kids doing things that are demonstrate relevance to the real world, <laughs> and that um, that require deeper thinking than just memorizing some facts and checking A, B, C, or D on a multiple choice test. So, so the work will be around making sure that demonstrated mastery isn't always a test. Some some subjects, some classes lend themselves to that more than others, but all of them need to include some kind of performance piece. I believe. Um, I'm not doing the curriculum work, the stack is, but I, I hope that as we design those, those end of course cr criteria and qualifiers, that some of it's demonstrated knowledge through some assessment and some think that students have designed, developed, or worked to demonstrate that they mastered that skill. So, you had a question? Yeah, I, I, I want to, in, in addressing the testing thing, my understanding is that nationally, uh, this sort of testing has been going on for years, and it's a way to measure 
a particular part of the country, a, a state, a district, how well they stack up. If I'm not mistaken, you might correct me on this, but my understanding is that it, it, it kind of gives you uh, a, a little bit of a temperature reading on where you are, where your kids are, relative to even the national level of, uh, of this, these sorts of tests. It's nothing new. I don't believe that it's anything that uh, is going to hurt a kid. Uh, I know going on in uh, employment and a wide array of, of jobs, it is a requirement that you test in. And if you don't have the background coming out of schools uh, with that experience of testing, and you go out into the employment workforce, you take a test to, to be a, a fireman or to be an aircraft mechanic or what have you, but you freeze, well, this is your chance to kind of work through some of those issues because the reality of life is you're going to be tested. And it would be crazy to drop the testing, in my opinion. Anything else anybody wanted to ask about the plan? You've got these chiefs here. They're really smart people. You should ask them some questions. I just had something of a positive thing. I think that the main key, one of the, the main things that you had talked about was perception in the community. And I think it's a very positive, going to be a very positive thing. Coming from a parent who was very involved in schools and then chose as, because of that involvement as a passion to go on to get my degree in teaching, I think people don't understand that there are many, many positive, and obviously us here, the ones that are here realize how positive things are and we wouldn't be here because we have a passion and a desire for it. But there are a lot of people that, as a parent, when you're gonna talk about your school and your kid's school, say the positive things. Talk about, change that perception. And another thing too, as far as the testing goes, really, it's a perception of what, it, it truly is a tool that as an educator, you, you have to have. You know, and I think a lot of people have the perception of what it's being used for and how it's being used for because publicly, nationwide, it's used as a judgment tool versus an assessment tool mm -hmm. or as something that we can use as educators and, and as a district to, to make things more positive and to make it better. So it is truly a perception problem, I feel. And I mm -hmm. think when you touch mm -hmm. base on that and, and do more of a positive thing and, and be an advocate. I mean, as a, as a parent, you know, be the voice and, and make sure that people are hearing what you're saying. But I think, in all fairness, from from a whole thing, it's it's truly testing has become has gotten such a, a negative perception, but it, it's really needed. To because we've used it in ways that the tests sometimes aren't meant to be used for things like deciding what classes somebody should be in or something, and that's not what they're meant for in most cases. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, it's one of your major priorities is to make sure we get for students of color and, and students of special education. That's my area of interest. But so, can you tell me some of the detail or expand a little bit on, on what you see happening that will mostly achieve the gap kids in special ed? I can, I, I'll speak in big general terms which might not be helpful to you, but right now um, the way our special education services uh, office is organized, I, I don't believe it's set up to be the, as effective as it can be. So what you'll see, I believe, if, if I believe that's the path we're on, is to have a, a, a two pieces to our special education program. One is a group of people who support the work of principals and IEP teams and um, assessment, people that evaluate students for special education to make sure that our processes are right, that um, we're timely, that we're in compliance with the law, that we're serving students right and putting them in the right kind of placements. And we need a, a group of people who really focus on that work. And then what I think we haven't done well is another group of people who are experts in autism, cognitive impairments, dyslexia, uh, physical disabilities, speech and language, um, hearing impairment, who really know how to teach children with those disabilities, who support teachers in knowing what to do with this child or that child or that child in their classroom. 
Um, special education teachers are trained to, to teach those kids, but all of us, I'm a former special education teacher, I come across students all the time, like, whoa, <coughs> we're not equipped for this child, I'm not sure what to do, that we have people that support teachers in the classroom with the instruction that they're providing to their students. So there's this whole piece of making sure that the services are right, the IEPs are right, that they're on time, that parents feel good about the placements that their children are put in and it's all compliant and you know, correct. And then there's this whole piece of supporting teachers and making sure that we have instructional tools, resources, programs, the kind of uh, the way to teach reading for students with dyslexia is very different. And do we offer that here? We're just actually starting to think about that. And we, we uh, need to train our teachers and then support them in ways that they can help the kids that they have in front of them. So it's really organizing the way we put our support, again, back out into schools and to students. And that's kind of a high-level answer. Um, do you, would you like to add anything, Rosalie? No, and that, that's really just reality the way that we have our resources because they're not targeting the specific areas. Like she said, how are we doing inclusion classes? How are we supporting the general education teacher that's working with the special education teacher, the EAs that also work in those classrooms? We need to get some targeted support to those people so that they can do the jobs that they need. We absolutely want to support inclusion for all of our students. The way we're staffing it now and the way that the model is, I think I, I think we went ahead and did it and then said now we got to make sure everybody gets trained instead of supporting people in, in knowing what to expect and how to plan for it in advance a little more thoughtfully. So we may adjust how it looks, but absolutely we will continue with inclusion. That's, that's the right thing to do is to have every child no matter what their disability, participate as much as they possibly can in regular education every day. Yes, ma'am? What is the IEP team and also what is the EA? Okay, IEP team is Individualized Education Plan. For students with a disability, we write a plan that says it sets goals for what they will learn and accomplish in a year, uh, and we do that every year with parents and with the special education teachers, and that's their individual plan that gets them where they need to go. And an EA is an educational assistant, that's a teacher assistant in the classrooms that's helping the teachers and the kids. I have a question um, regarding the Turning Point Academy, that's up and running, right? Not till second semester, right? <coughs> you want to, January, right? at Turning Point? We'll start January 27th. There are 
our students who are in credit recovery and who are in need um, an alternative setting, who will stay at the Mass Center and probably finish out their high school career there. But there are students at the Mac Center right now, there's about seven of them who were there for a behavior reassignment, a temporary reassignment, and those students have finished their term and then will return back to their home school. But one of the challenges with the Mac Center, the way it was ran, is that you had two different populations being mixed, none of them being served to the opera. And that's what we're trying to do with time. So there, there's anywhere from five to 10 kids that will go to tournament points when we open. Yes, ma'am, did you have a question? I don't, I actually just have a comment. Okay. Um, I wanted to take a moment to applaud, I'm sorry, I'm Kelly Hyman. I am on the Wisconsin State PTA Board of Directors. I'm the region advisor for all of the PTAs, PTSAs in this room. I wanted to take a moment to applaud you for your support in the PTA. I think it's something that's been lacking for a lot of the time. And when I look at what your three priorities are, when you talk about grading student achievement, I mean, statistically speaking, children that uh, have the support in the home, they do better. There's a higher um, graduation rate. And contrary to popular belief, we are not a bake sale organization. <laughs> Our main objective is to bridge the gap between uh, home life and school life and getting parents involved. And I just very, very much appreciate uh, the change that I've seen this school year in the schools that are coming forward and asking for help for me to get them back in good standing with the, uh, the state and the national organization. And I just, mm -hmm. I want to thank you because that's exactly what, in my opinion, needs to happen. Right. So on. for so long we've said, uh, I'm an involved parent, and that means that I go to the bake sale and I show up at the at the party, whatever it is, and I, you know, I am all the time in school, and that makes me a good parent. And we know, um, and I speak from my own experience, my parents never darkened the door of the school, <laughs> ever, and they were wonderfully supportive parents because they were at home making sure I did my homework getting me to bed on time, getting me up on time, all those things, teaching me all those responsibility skills. So there are great parents who aren't at the bake sale. Um, and just because I'm a parent that goes to every single bake sale doesn't mean that I have a relationship and a partnership with a teacher that will advance my child's learning in school. In fact, sometimes those are the very parents who would say, I'm going to do that so that we can deflect the whole issue that my child has some issues. <laughs> I'm a good parent. I'm here all the time. Don't tell me my child has this or that problem. So um, we want to change that parent engagement, parent involvement thinking to be how well are parents feeling like they are a partner with their child's teacher in looking at how their child is learning and growing. And that's a big shift that we need to make, all of us, because our heads always still say, well, she's an involved parent because she's, or he's a, because of that. We see them all the time, but that, you know, that doesn't necessarily tell the whole story. <laughs> I have two questions. Um, and then we got about five minutes. I'm going to take yours, and then I saw your hand, and then we'll You mentioned end. that in one of the slides, you said in three years, we will have standards-based grading. So I'm wondering when about in those three years you're expecting that. And the second question is, you made a comment that by, by graduation, and I think you said all students will either graduate with AP classes that they can take on to college. No, we were going to in increase the percentage of kids who have that. So we would not expect every child to do that. Okay. But we, whatever, and that's why we have, to, I haven't put it up there yet, because we need to know what our baseline is, where are we right now, and we want to increase that. So we have more students uh, accomplishing advanced placement courses um, and more students with those career technical credits if they want them and need them. Because we can't say that every single child has to do that. That wouldn't be I necessarily fair. I thought you said all yeah. students would have that or technology. The other thing is sometimes I, I, I really have a hard time with this when kids are taking college chemistry or college physics when they're 17 and 16 years old. How can, how can their brains be developed enough mm -hmm. to be working at a college level, which is 20, 21, with 
things happen in the brains that they're they're not ready for at mm -hmm. 17, especially physics. Mm -hmm. Of all the classes I can think of, Mr. how can we possibly <laughs> think kids can do physics when they're? Well, my daughter took it at 16, and she couldn't. Yeah, she couldn't and do it. And I think there, I was at a conference last spring, it was very interesting because there was a guy who had done a lot of research about kids in uh, advanced placement courses and the fact of the matter is that, and chemistry and physics were the two especially, that students ended up still taking the, they didn't take, they didn't come to college and take chemistry two or physics two, they still took the physics one, they just did better because they'd had that experience. Um, but we're using do you want to respond? But we're using college books, we're using, you know, at this yeah, time, they do, we're using right. college uh -huh. books for 17-year-olds right. right. mm -hmm. that are yeah. It's just so hard. It is hard. Yeah. Um, and your first question was the grading. When, how, the rollout, I think first year we'll do elementary. Yeah. The first year is um, elementary. Elementary is probably more conducive to do an earlier rollout. Middle and high school require a little bit more back. Behind the scenes work, working with staff to create power standards in common assessment, there's a lot more work that needs to happen with secondary schools. Elementaries, pretty much, most elementary teachers, they don't realize they do it already, but they already grade that way. Yeah. They, they just don't call it that. Most teachers grade that way. So you'll so see it in elementary, and then middle, and then high over the next two to three years. Uh, the question I had after the comment, um, I also applaud you as far as um, putting parents first, parents and students first, because if it wasn't for students and parents, there would be no schools. Right. <laughs> uh, also, yeah. to, um, to let you know, also, that Wisconsin is, and you probably already know this information, is the worst state in the country because of the achievement gap, 50th in the country. And I think that is also because of the parents not being involved, like she was talking about. And in African-American homes, there's a different culture that you have to look at, and I think that hasn't been addressed. And I think I'm glad you brought that up as far as looking towards trying to address that issue. Um, not necessarily just putting African Americans in the classroom, but you need uh, more people that understand African American culture and mm -hmm. idealism and the, all the things that go along with that in order to close the achievement gap because a lot of things come from the environment that a lot of our students are coming from. Yes, that that's, that'll be a big piece of the professional development and learning that we'll be offering our teachers are those opportunities to uh, develop cultural competency, um, make sure that their instruction is culturally relevant, that's right. the phrase we say, to make sure that they're in tune to what, what that means, what the implications are of being a white person and African American student in front of you. What, are, what does that mean about your teaching? Right. Um, and that's, that's a huge, that's, that right there could be five years of work. <laughs> but we certainly want to start down that way. Last one, that's your okay. it. <laughs> I apologize, but I'm going to change the tone here a little bit. My name is Scott. I've lived here my whole life. I'm not a union member, I'm not a teacher, I'm a parent. I've lived here my whole life. Um, I grew up in the late 70s and 80s. I've seen this town go from manufacturing town to a town that has lose, lost hundreds and thousands of jobs. We've seen wages go down in the city. We've seen parents without jobs. We've seen, when I was a student growing up, I could care less about a meeting like this. My friends could care less about a meeting like this. We could care less about school. We had our own things. If, if a, a good dinner for me growing up was Salisbury steak on like a Wednesday night. Mm -hmm. My mom was on public assistance for a while. Um, fortunately for me, my dad, he wasn't the greatest dad, but he had a strong work ethic. So I never, when I was in middle school and high school, I never saw the value of an education. It finally took me to pony up and go to college and realize how important the education is. A city like Racine could lift itself up by embracing education. But unfortunately, there are hundreds, maybe thousands of kids, I don't want to say thousands, that might be a little too much. There are many kids and many parents in this city that don't value education. They don't value this plan. They're, they just, my, my point is that I'm a little bit skeptical that there are, we're gonna change how Race and Unified operates. We're gonna try to bring in new teachers. We're gonna try to, 
teach teachers how to deal with kids from disadvantaged neighborhoods. Many of the teachers in this city live in this city, and we see, I mean, I'm, like I said, I'm not a teacher, but as a citizen of racing, we see these issues on a daily basis. Um, jobs aren't gonna come back to racing like they need to be, and we have parents and students who deal with issues on a daily basis, like coming home with a, a paycheck. So, I, I just, I hope that we all realize that um, holding teachers accountable by itself isn't the answer. We have to hold students and parents accountable. I was fortunate that, like I said, my dad had a great work ethic. He wasn't the greatest dad, but I saw value in, in what he did. And unfortunately, <coughs> without that internal motivation, none of this is gonna work. Mm -hmm. So I just, I, I applaud your energy and that you have a plan, but I mean, this, this is serious. And we, like I said, I, told, I believe that as a city, education, is the most important thing to lifting up a whole community. And I just, I don't know if I have a question or if I'm just. I'll just say one thing and then we can end on that. I was, reminded <laughs> just, I, I, I was reminded yesterday by, by a meeting that I was in by someone about something that I uh, saw and uh, heard someone say once before. And that is, you know, in anything that's changed, you have the early adopters, and I always, I always call those people the explorers. You know, if you think about our country and the history, we had those people that were way out over there to the east or to the west coast, and they were the explorers, and they left everybody at home and went off. You know, so those are early adopters on any new plan or any new work. And then there's the people who are the the settlers and the pioneers who kind of come on behind. And if you go and it's safe, I'll go there too. And then there's always that group of people who are the stay at home. No way, I'm never gonna get up and go anywhere, I'm here. And he reminded us that um, all you need is 18% of your people on board. If you have your early adopters and some of those, some of those settlers, pioneers, and, that, and you have 18%, that will turn it. And so people like yourself and the people who are here tonight, you are all part of that 18%. And once we amass enough people who believe and support and endorse and actually actively support and endorse and believe, we, will, we can turn that. And then everybody will jump on board because there's people waiting to see, well, I'll be part of that once I'm sure it's gonna succeed, then I wanna be there. You know, and there's other people who will never believe that this is the right plan or that this is the right work or that Racine has any business even trying. And I've met some of those people and I hear from them too. <laughs> but um, we need all of you early adopters to jump on and do your part and see your place in this plan and what you can do to support us in this work. And so with that, thank you very much for coming out on a nasty night. And thank you for your